Good morning. Great to see everybody here this morning. Thank you for joining us here at Riverwood for worship. If you're, uh, if you're a guest with us this morning, there's a, a, a communication card in the seat back in front of you. If you fill that out and put it in the offering as it goes by or take it to the, uh, to the counter out in the foyer, uh, um, we've got information for you. We'd love to, uh, love to, have, uh, to know that you are here. As well, out in the counter, a lot of information in the bulletin, a couple of things we want to bring to your attention. A uh, couple of camps coming up very soon. This week is uh, Camp X for the 5th and 6th graders, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday morning. More information on that out in the foyer. And then next week, Camp Riverwood for the younger kids on Monday through Thursday in the evening. These are ways that you can, you can be involved, help us out. Pray, donate some of the items that are still needed. We still have volunteers, and it's time to register or invite your kids. And so any of that information out in the foyer as well. So I encourage you to, uh, to sign up, to help, to sign up for children, certainly to pray. Thank you for that. Two weeks from today, on the 17th, uh, will be worship on the lawn. As we do every June, we'll be out in the back lawn worshiping as one service out there, and we'll do baptisms on that Sunday as we often do. And so if you've never been baptized, you'd like to be a candidate for baptism, this is your next opportunity. I encourage you to do that today and next week. There are baptism classes. Uh, you only have to go to one. It's, we're offering it twice, but it's a one-week one class immediately following this service at 11.15 or 11.15 next week. So if you're interested in baptism, I encourage you to, uh, to check that out either uh, next hour or next week, and then come to the service on the 17th uh, as we worship on the lawn. Thank you for joining us this morning. Lots of more information in the bulletin. Make sure you check that out later. But now, Justin, please lead us. Morning, church. It's great to be with you this morning. If this is your first time here at Riverwood, uh, we just want to say welcome again. We're, we're really glad that you've joined us this morning. We continue this week in our series in the parables. Uh, this will carry us throughout the entire summer. Uh, talking through Jesus' teaching, using this particular form of a parable to teach truths uh, mainly about the kingdom of God and, and what that is and what that looks like, this kingdom that he has come to inaugurate. And so it's interesting to think, even as, as we think about the idea of the kingdom of God, the beginnings, the humble beginnings of that with Christ's ministry as he came to earth as a baby, as a ruling king but a baby, uh, to start his ministry, and then all the way even to his death and the humility that he showed by, by going to the cross on our behalf from a baby to this death, which he didn't deserve to die. And in Philippians 2, we're going to hear from it in a, in a moment, but Paul is talking to the church in Philippi, and he, he's telling them, have this same humility, live with this same intention that Christ came and showed as he went to the cross on our behalf. And so can we stand together? I want us to, well, I'll pray for us and then we'll hear from God's word together as we begin our morning. Father, thank you that you have given us this day, this time, this place once again to meet together, to lift up your name, to worship you, to hear from your word. Spirit, we pray, would you please speak to us as your word is brought to us? Would you teach us? Would you remind us? all of these things that you have said to us. And God, we, we ask that you would help us in this time, in this place this morning, to worship you, to magnify you, to make much of who you are. We thank you again this morning for Christ and the humility that he showed in coming as a baby, dying for us. And yet in no way did that minimize or minimalize the the. Thing, the very thing that he came to do, which was declare victory over death and over sin. He shows us that as our, our conquering king in that way. So Lord, we join together this morning as your people. Would you help us to worship you in these moments? And it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but instead it emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by be becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him 
and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. string so we're going to sing this acapella praise the father praise the son oh sovereign god oh matchless king the saints adore the angels sing and fall before the throne of grace to you belongs the highest praise these sufferings these sufferings, this passing time, under your wings, I will abide, 
And every enemy shall flee. You are my hope and victory. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son. Praise the Spirit, three in one, clothed in power and in grace, the name above all other names. To the valley, and to the valley for my soul, thy great descent has made me whole. Your word my heart has welcomed home. Now peace like water ever flow. Praise, and praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit, three in one, clothed in power and in grace, the name above. All other names praise praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, clothed in power and in grace, the name above all other names yours. Please pray with me. Oh, Lord, this morning we praise the Father, we praise the Son, the name that is above all names, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who leads the nations. Father, we just thank you for how powerful you are and how kind, how loving you are, that you sacrificed your son for us, that we could spend eternity with you. Lord, we give you all thanks and praise this morning for your greatness, for your loving kindness, which is better than life itself. Lord, we thank you. And Father, we thank you for what is uh, going to happen this week with uh, Camp X. And uh, just pray for uh, that you would prepare the hearts of the students that are coming, Lord. Uh, soften their hearts to you, Father. And as they hear your word, I pray that they would place their faith in Jesus for forgiveness of sins and, and uh, to surrender their lives to you, God. I pray for the student leaders and for the uh, adult leaders that you would enable them, Lord, this week to... Share the love of Christ with the students that are coming and to, to be your ambassadors to them. Lord, please fill them with your spirit and with your wisdom and your love and your joy and help them to be Christ to the ones that are coming. Help them to disciple, Lord, and to build them up in you. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do as a result of Camp X this week. 
And Father, I lift up uh, the Akeem people to you. Uh, just thank you, Father, for your spirit moving in that community. Pray, Father, for a continued outpouring of your spirit to the Akeem people, that you would soften their hearts and prepare them for your gospel. And pray that you would raise up many churches that would pray for the Akeem, Father, all across the nation, that you would burden them with uh, this people that has not heard of Jesus. We just thank you, God, for what you're doing and uh, pray it would continue and uh, pray that you would reveal yourself, Lord, to the Akeem. Lord, we, uh, we lift up uh, the message to you today. Father, we ask that you would uh, speak to us through your word, through your spirit, through your servant, and uh, help us to apply your word to our lives, God. And now we uh, praise you, Lord, through our offerings. We worship you. And uh, Lord, we give ourselves to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you this morning as we look at God's Word um, together. And two weeks ago, we began this journey in this uh, series on parables. And at the very beginning, Jesus says, Let all who have ears, let them hear. You see, these aren't just stories about weeds and seeds and treasures and pearls. I mean, if you hear those stories, that's one level of hearing, but they aren't just nice stories. There's something deeper that is happening. Jesus is telling us parables to capture our imaginations, to challenge the assumptions of how we are to live life, and to move us, to, to move us into action, into doing things differently. That's the whole point of parables. And so this morning, it's the same question is going to be asked and the same kind of declaration. All who have ears, let them hear. Are we hearing what Jesus is saying? That's going to be our challenge this morning. And so we're going to look at six different parables in rapid fire kind of action here. And uh, there is one word that links all of these parables together. They are called the kingdom parables. Kingdom. And the word kingdom is one of Jesus' favorite words. If you were to count the number of times Jesus used the word kingdom in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it'd be over a hundred. He loved to talk about the kingdom. Even in the book of Acts, after he was resurrected, Luke tells us that he went around appearing to lots of people and talking about you guessed it, the kingdom. He couldn't stop talking about the kingdom. And so now he has parables that he talks about 
the kingdom. And so the first question we might need to ask is, what did people in the first century think about this kingdom idea? What did they assume about kingdom? His kingdom was coming. It was going to be about power and rule and no more enemies. I mean, it's kind of how we assume the word kingdom in our own vernacular as well. I liken it to my childhood. Growing up in the summertime when uh, my friends would gather together on those cloudy, rainy days, we'd gather to play Monopoly. Anybody like the game Monopoly? We have some Monopoly. I have some, who hates the game Monopoly? Anyone hates the game? All right, you're honest about that. All right. So I was reading this past week about strategies of winning Monopoly. Do you know what the number one strategy to winning Monopoly is? Be the banker. <laughs> now, I'm not saying it to be dishonest. You know, one for the banker, one for me. Uh, no, but someone did some statistical analysis on which properties are the best to go after. And so here's some inside information on Monopoly. They did it based on the number of times people land on these properties. They did it on the cost of the houses and the hotels to put on and rent and all of that. Which color do you think are the best properties to own? Railroads are good too, but there's a property, it is these properties, orange. So, so if you're playing that game with your kids later on today, make sure you get the orange properties. All right. But kingdom, that's the whole point of monopoly, building your kingdom, building houses, building hotels, putting people out of business, ruling, and doing whatever it takes. And that's what they thought about kingdom in the first century as well. And the question is this, is that what Jesus wants us to think about kingdom? When he prayed, your, he told us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Is that what we're praying for? Absolute rule and power and no more enemies. And is that what kingdom, well, Jesus is going to clear that up for us this morning. And he's going to use parables to do that. And so all who have ears, let them hear. Uh, what Jesus has to say. And so if you have your Bible, we're going to look at it in Matthew chapter 13. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be on the screen around uh, the room. Uh, but in chapter 13, uh, starting in uh, verse 40 or 24, this is what Jesus says. He says, He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom, here he goes, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and they went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants and the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. All right, so Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven, he's given us some insider it's kind of secrets of the kingdom. This is what the kingdom is really about. And he says it's kind of like a, he has this odd little story about someone who would have the audacity to come and spread weeds among wheat. And so we think about weeds, we have this in our brains, don't we? As we think of the dandelions and the, when we think about somebody standing over a pristine green lawn, blowing dandelion seed over it. First hour had somebody cringing at that, like, oh, my lawn. What? But that's not what was happening in the first century. It was something more akin to this kind of picture. Where on the left you have wheat, and on the right you have tares, also called darnel. You see the problem, Right? What's the problem? They look virtually the same. How can you tell the difference between those two? 
And so what Jesus is really getting at in this parable happens to be some really secrets of the kingdom. You see, this isn't just a story about weeds and wheat. He's saying something much deeper. And the disciples, they were actually perplexed. Like, is he just talking about weeds and wheat? And so they actually go to him, and Jesus explains to them what he means by this parable. And so in verse 36, this is what Jesus says. He says, Then he left the crowds, and he went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. Are you just talking about weeds and wheat? I, he answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will be it be at the end of the age. That's what the parable really means. And so what Jesus is trying to do, again, is challenge our assumptions of kingdom. What we assume. And he's got this insider look. He wants us to know. And these secrets he wants to pass on. And the first one goes something like this. Is to realize that the kingdom of heaven in the here and now, in this space here and now that we live, where there is a competing kingdom intertwined, is very hard to see. There's a competing kingdom in the midst of the other kingdom. Two kingdoms, side by side. They're, they're hard to tell apart from one another. And the, the one about the weed is really the origins of the evil one, the devil. He is sowing seeds in this world. What does that look like? Well, there are lots of lies. The deceiver is filled with lies. And there are lots of lies to believe. And in the competing kingdom, there are lies about kingdom, building kingdom, being happy. You deserve more. Just build a bigger hotel on your property. And all of these lies that are wrapped around this idea of winning and getting rid of enemies and ruling and power and happiness. And that kingdom exists in the midst of God's kingdom. Did you see in, in the parable, both of these kingdoms are growing together. And it's not just an idea that's out there, but it's an idea that is sown in the hearts of man everywhere. Some out there and some even, dare I say, who come to church on Sunday mornings. Yes, it's true. You could be someone who is living the Darnell, the weed kind of life, right here. And the dangerous part is that you can sprinkle in just enough Jesus to make yourself feel good when the whole time your real allegiance is to the world. See, there's a competing kingdom. It's, it's hard to see and to parse and so right here, we pause at this moment to say, which, which one are we? Are we the one on the left, the wheat? Or are we the one on the right, the, the weed? The wheat or the weed? What, what kind of life are we living? See, that's what the parable wants us to stop and pause and ask deeper questions. And I believe God uses moments like this in churches to have us pause to ask questions about our own lives and what kingdom are we really a part of? You see, to really tell the difference, a biologist would have to get to a molecular level to see the difference of those two. And Jesus in this moment wants us to go to a molecular level of what's going on inside, in, in our hearts. What do we really believe? What are we really longing after in this world? Is it just about a bigger kingdom for ourselves or are we looking to be a part of his kingdom see if you're a part of his kingdom that means you are sold out to him being the king and we submit ourselves to him we surrender our lives to jesus christ the true king 
the one who died for our sins, who rose again so that we could have forgiveness and, and have eternity worked out. Our allegiance is to that kind of king and kingdom. Or is it? Or is it? That's the whole point of the parable. And so there is a competing kingdom, and looks can be deceiving. You really have to get to the deeper issues of the heart. And that's what Jesus is talking about in the first secret of the kingdom. He has another secret he wants to pass on to us. Let's move on to the next one. It builds off of that one. In verse 31, he has two more parables starting there. He says, He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom, here he is again, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. All right, another aspect of the kingdom that Jesus wants to whisper into our ears. And this time he's using images of mustard seeds and, and leaven. Here's a picture, I don't know if last time you saw a picture of a mustard seed. It is actually that small, very tiny. And not only that, what he's really getting at is the smallness of it, but then the next picture really of what it can become. It grows into something of this bush and tree and something that is sturdy, even to the point where in the parable the birds of the air find a way to find rest and nesting in the tree. And so Jesus is now telling us uh, another kind of story about the kingdom. And this is what he's telling us about the kingdom in the here and now. It's, it's where authentic righteousness has humble beginnings followed by incredible growth. You see, in his kingdom, there's authentic righteousness is the way of life. And it has very humble beginnings that is followed by incredible growth. When Jesus was first talking about parables, he said, uh, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And so there is an authentic righteousness that he is wanting us to seek in his kingdom. And it's humble, humble people. If you look at the trajectory of the scriptures, I mean, it's people like Abraham, who is very unassuming. Yet God said, I am going to multiply you like the stars in the sky. People like Moses, who said, I can't speak in front of people. I, don't, I can't do that well. But yet he used Moses to then lead the people out of Egypt, across the Red Sea. People like David, just a shepherd boy. Very humble beginnings. But yet he used him in powerful kingdom ways. And the stories go on and on. That's the kind of things that happen in his kingdom. That's the secret. And it always has and it always will be. You see, the competing kingdom of the world says it's all about power and strength and status Bigger hotels. But that's not what's happening here in God's kingdom. It's about mustard seeds that are planted that then grow into something beautiful for the kingdom. What does this mean for us? So we pause at this point and say, okay, I, I, we get the concept, but what does that look like in our lives? Well, let me just give you one example. One would be there's a couple in our church who want to plant authentic seeds, mustard seeds of marriage. How do they do that? What does that look like? Well, it looks like going back to God's word. What, what does it mean to have mustard seed kind of marriage? Well, we go into God's word and we see in his way, he calls men to love their wives more than they love themselves. You see, that's a competing message 
of the world. The world says, go and have power and status and whatever makes you happy. But in the mustard seed kind of kingdom of God's kingdom, it's about men who actually love women, their wives, more than they love themselves. And they're willing to, sat- to, to give up status and career and money and whatever it might look like to accomplish that because that's the covenant that they made. And in the same breath, mustard seed kind of marriage for women means that they're going to follow after the man who is going to do that. That they will support and love and cherish the man who will do that. And it might mean, again, sacrificing the things on their end of career and power and status and and whatever that is. But that's just one example of mustard seed kind of marriage. But you can see when you plant that, it seems so tiny and insignificant. Yet, God will grow that. And he will grow it into something that is beautiful for his kingdom. To the point where people will take notice. The world will take notice. The birds of the world will come and find rest and see stability in something that is beautiful in God's sight. See, that's how his kingdom works. And we can have conversations about mustard seed kind of parenting and mustard seed kind of uh, relating to our neighbors and mustard seed kind of being the right kind of workers, mustard seed kind of being the right kinds of bosses. You see, in his economy, in his kingdom, authentic righteousness and seeking after this has humble beginnings. And God will use it for incredible growth. Let all who have ears Let them hear. All right, Jesus wants to add on some more to the things and aspects about his kingdom. It's about righteousness. It's about competitors that are hard to see. But then he moves in this way in verse 44. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and he sells all that he has, and he buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, Jesus is whispering to us another aspect of the kingdom, another secret Things that we assume about kingdom aren't the things that he realizes to be true about his kingdom. When I was a young boy, I can say that now that I'm getting older. When I was a young boy, I collected baseball cards, loved baseball cards. And it probably became probably a problem when the day that I got one of those guides and I found out that they had value— Then I started looking at every card differently. Like, which card is this? Does it have value? Is it just a common card? And I had all the price guides. And I was really into baseball cards that way. To the point where I would then invite my friends over to kind of peruse their collection. (laughs) And so I remember this one day, my friend came over and uh, he had this card in his collection. This is a 1984 Don Mattingly rookie card. And according to the price guide in my brain at the time, this card was worth about $50. I didn't have anybody, I hadn't seen one of these cards. I didn't know anybody who had one, but he did. And in that moment, I had this feeling. I have to have this card. (laughs) And that's the exact feeling that Jesus is going to in this parable. Now, the end of the story is, I didn't get the card. But in the end of the parable, this is what Jesus wants us to feel. See, he tells us a story about a field. And somewhere in that field, a man is walking through, just a passerby, and he comes and he stumbles across a treasure. And in the first century, before banks and safety deposit boxes, this is where you would hide something of great value, in the ground. No one's going to find it, or would they? And so that's the one story, is someone kind of stumbles across a, a treasure, and he has to have it. The other parable is about the pearl, a merchant. He sees this pearl, and it has such great value. 
And at the same time, he says, I need that. I will do whatever it takes. And the parable is really focused in on the acquiring. Whatever it takes, I will get it. Because, in verse 44, he says, because there is joy. That's where true joy is found. And so in verse 44, he kind of gives us the key to this parable. That is where joy is. And because of that, you will then sell everything. You will do whatever it takes to get it. And so Jesus is whispering to us in this moment about his kingdom. And he says, that's how my kingdom is. That where true joy is found. And it's found in having allegiance to Jesus. And being willing to sacrifice everything for it. That's what it means to be in his kingdom. To find that kind of joy. And again, the competing kingdom of the world is saying something much different. The competing kingdom is saying, you be happy, you be your own king. Just build a bigger hotel, it'll be all fine. And Jesus is saying, no, true joy, true joy is found in having a relationship with me. And once you have found that, once you have realized, once the light has clicked on that idea, then you will sell everything to have it. And so out of this set of two parables, there are lots of questions that spring out of it. One is, where is your true joy? Is it in bigger hotels? Or is it in Jesus Christ? In Christ alone, my joy And if it's not, then why isn't it? What is competing for your affections of your heart? This past week, I asked myself the kind of question that I think comes out of this text to say something like this. Do I have Don Mattingly rookie card love for Jesus Christ? And whatever that is in your life, do you have that kind of love and allegiance that you just have to have. And if you don't, then what is competing? What is competing? Because whatever is competing will never fulfill what you're deeply longing for. Again, joy at the deep level of the heart is only found in Jesus Christ and having a relationship with him, the one who can forgive Let all who have ears, let him hear. Three stories, six different parables. It's about kingdom. It's about allegiances. It's it's about joy and righteousness, all of these things. What has caught your attention this morning as you have walked in here? Maybe for the first time. Maybe you're visiting our church But God is speaking to you in his word saying, you know what? I need to check this out further. What is it that he is saying to you? But all who have ears, let them hear what Jesus is truly saying. And what he is truly saying is, at the end of the day, it is about having a relationship with him. And if you want to know more about that, or you have more questions, or you have doubts, we would love to talk with you as a church about that. But for those who do have ears and hear, then these are sweet words. You understand. You resonate with this. When he starts talking about joy and righteousness and competing kingdom, you're right there. May we keep furthering his kingdom in the here and now with our lives. See, it's not just about weeds and mustard seeds and leaven and hidden treasures and pearls. There is a much deeper message that is happening that Jesus wants us to know. And so with that being said, I'm going to pray for us this morning as we close. Dear Lord, we thank you for your words to us. These stories that we hear. 
And at some level, there, there are nice, entertaining stories. But what they are really meant to do is challenge us at deep levels of what we assume to be true. And Lord, I just pray that you would allow all of us to assess and to be honest and to take a moment to pause, to say, where are we really at when it comes to this conversation of kingdom? Are we a true citizen of your kingdom? Or are we just playing games? Do we really understand what it means to have a relationship with your son of, by faith, through his gift of grace that he offers us. If we're still pondering and wondering, I pray that you would use this moment to challenge even that idea. Help us to be the kinds of people who understand kingdom and, and live kingdom in the here and now. One day it'll all come together, but in the here and now, may we live as citizens of your kingdom. Give us the wisdom and the perseverance to do that, even in the midst of a world that is competing for your kingdom allegiance. Thank you. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Once a month, we gather together around this table. And this table is all about telling the story of what Jesus Christ has done, the true king, the one who our allegiance is to above anything else the one who died and rose again. And these, this table tells that story. Bread that is broken, that tells the story of Jesus Christ's body that was broken. His blood that was shed by this Jews represented. And because of that, there can be the forgiveness of sins. There can be entrance into a brand new kingdom because of what he has done. And if you have that kind of relationship with Jesus, if you have made that kind of decision in your life, then this table is open for you to come and to be reminded of that kingdom purpose. If not, you can just kind of watch and see and maybe ponder some deeper things of what we were talking about this morning. I find it very interesting, though, that when Jesus came and instituted this meal with his disciples, once again, his favorite word popped up. Listen to these words from Jesus around this moment in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, the promise of which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He says, I tell you that I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. See, this kingdom story is the here and now, but it is headed to an eternal kingdom where there will be no more competitors where there will be no more crying and pain and the only way to that kingdom is through the king and if you recognize that then again this table is open for you to come and uh, here at our church uh, you can if you're sitting out in the different er sections we'll come forward on the outside and if you're in the middle sections, kind of come down the middle aisles, everybody will filter back through this way. Just take the elements back to your seat. This is a quiet moment between you and God. And uh, we'll just take a couple of minutes as elders and pastors to prepare the table, and then the table will be open. So pastors, elders, come, and uh, let's ready ourselves. And then when we are finished, uh, the table will be open for you to come forward. That death surrendered 
to the mighty cross of Jesus Christ, the earth beneath the of darkness.
Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed and trenched in. This is our God, a sacred refuge is your name, your kingdom is unshakable, with you forever we will be, a mighty fortress is our
His kingdom is unshakable. What great news that is for those who are part of his kingdom. And if you want to know more or you have more questions, I'll be down here in the front. I'd love to interact with you, even pray with you. Um, but as we go, we're going to say our benediction that we say every week, and it talks about the kind of kingdom that is in the here and now. Uh, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in his grace today.